can start, Christina. Okay. Hello and welcome to our first Launch and Learn of the Web Conference Week. Today, our sponsor is Sequent. And the presenters are Philip Schill, the Senior Consultant and Geotechnical Information Manager for Bentley, and Shudor Roy, the Customer Solution Specialist for Sequence. They will present using open ground for managing ground investigation data. Sh uh, Philip and Shador, welcome, and thanks for being here today. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Right, okay, so Sadur and I just put on our webcams just because we like to prove that we are real people. So um, we're going to turn those off for the presentation, though. So while we move some things uh, around and whatnot, so don't worry, don't panic. Um, things are still happening the way they should be. And Sadur, tell me if you cannot see my screen now. Hopefully it should all be okay, though. I can see your screen. Marvellous, with the reassuring sight of a PowerPoint slide, I hope. So anyway, hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you for making the time to uh, to join us out of your uh, your busy day. I hope you find this, uh, this presentation informative, entertaining, you get something from it. Um, welcome. We're going to be showcasing Open Ground. Um, just to make you aware, this presentation is actually uh, an adapted single segment from a larger workflow, effectively a larger presentation that Sadur and I were involved with presenting, along with a couple of other colleagues recently. So a little bit more about that later, later on in our PowerPoint presentation. Before that, here is a slide with some faces on it, just to tell you a little bit more about us. So collectively, we have about 30 years experience with uh, with throwing bits of geotechnical software around the place, if not more. Um, so that's, that's kind of us as we're working through. But really, rather than, than us and focusing just on us as individuals, we also want to tell you a little bit um, about the organization that uh, that we work for, just in case you've uh, come across any of the names previously and help to clarify and confirm that Sequent is now part of Bentley Systems. So we are the Bentley's the Bentley Systems subsurface company. Now, while Bentley specializes in the surface or the built world, Sequent specializes in the subsurface. So well, typically, the former emphasizes precision, we're more concerned, more used to working with uncertainty. And I'm sure that those of you who made the time to attend this session are all too well aware of that. In terms of the big picture, therefore, we're about connecting these two related yet distinct disciplines. Now, specifically, as Sequent, we want to turn the subsurface from a risk to be managed into being an opportunity to be taken. Now, to help us with that, there are various products within the Sequent portfolio that can help with that very broad remit. Now, for the purpose of today, we are assuming that we are talking to a civils orientated uh, audience, uh, geotechnical engineers, and the like. And with that assumption, the main product that we're going to be focusing on today will be open ground. Um, now, hopefully, we're also going to have a taste of Leapfrog as well. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that I do believe that there are some other products that are mentioned here that are likely to be highly relevant to what you do as well. So these are those products just highlighted on my screen now. Um, and indeed, GeoStudio, Central, Plaxis, they, are, they have important role, roles to play in that broader workflow that I mentioned just a few minutes previously. Okay, now this is where each of those products sit within the life of a typical civils project. So you can see the, uh, the products they just listed at the bottom of the screen and obviously highlighted as well. Now, as you can see, Leapfrog is there throughout the whole journey, 
creating and evolving the 3D geological model. As an early step, LeapFrog takes the most relevant data from our geotechnical information management platform, and that is open ground. With the help of our cloud-based model management platform, Central, we can now directly send critical por portions of our LeapFrog model, be it sections or 3D models, to our geotechnical analysis tools, Plaxis and GeoStudio. So you've got two cloud-based tools there, Open Ground and Central. Now, Open Ground, our primary focus for the presentation today, is for ground investigation data management. It's all about data, while Central is more for model management. So that's the subtle difference between the two. So as this next slide shows, these applications together represent a full workflow. As individuals, you may be involved in some or many of these particular steps. Now, as we mentioned earlier on, um, time is rather limited, and so we can't go through this full workflow in its entirety. Kind of mentioned that Sadura and I did so with a couple of colleagues recently, and it took three two and a half hour sessions. So obviously, we're not going to be able to cram all of that in. Um, it made sense, though, to give you a taste, if you like the uh, the trailer, if you will, for the uh, the broader workflow. And we thought we'd just cram in what we could of the first few steps on this particular slide. I just really need you to be aware that what we're not doing is giving you the complete story, just what we could do with the time that was available. So maybe seeking out those additional presentations you might consider to be your homework after this particular session. Um, before we get cracking with a, uh, a demonstration, though, I'd like to stop for a moment or two. And I think, Christina, you have a uh, poll that you want to put to the audience. So that should come up somewhere on your uh, on your screen. And we're just really interested in learning if, uh, if you've used one of our products beforehand uh, or one of those products that we had on the list there. And, uh, and indeed, if so, which, uh, which it might be. Cool. So I'll let that rumble on in the background. And then as we're uh, going with that, let's have a look at the software. So let's take a look at Open Ground itself. So I'm going to just uh, drop my PowerPoint there. And hopefully what you can see is some aerial photography, but accessed within the open ground interface. So you've got some other bits and pieces going on here as well. This is a typical view that you might see, just a way of showing data in my, uh, in my particular system. Now, I'm going to be jumping across a number of uh, different projects throughout this presentation. Um, this first project, we're going to assume that really what I know at, uh, at this stage in the life of the project is everything that you can see on the screen right now. Maybe I've just literally finished the phone call to my client, and after a bit of, uh, bit of a conversation, I've worked out where the site is that they've actually acquired. I don't know anything else about it at this particular stage. I just want a way of kind of marking it off. So I'm going to go across to set project extents and I'm just eyeballing in uh, a kind of a, a polygon just to represent a boundary for my particular site. Here we go. Just to give me uh, a way of showing this while I define anything else that might be going on on my particular site. So you can see I've got a message back saying that you've updated the boundary. That then appears on a layer of my map, which I'll now just sort of switch on. And you can see it gives me a way of just representing that particular project. Very early on, that's the grand total of what, what I might actually know. Um, OK, so Open Ground, it gives me the ability to connect up to web mapping services. So typically, maps. Let's say geological maps. I mean, actually, there could be anything that you might find helpful. Um, but we're going to assume geological maps in this particular case. Um, you may well have guessed from the accent that I'm based in the UK, just for transparency. So is this particular project. That basically means that I have ex access to some geological maps effectively within the public domain provided by the British Geological Survey. I would imagine for, that for a number of you who are attending this particular conference, you're going to be based in uh, in North America. 
similarly you'll find that there's a lot of geological mapping made available as web mapping services that you can connect to with open ground that's made available on a state by state basis just be careful to check the license agreements and make sure you're complying with what uh, what they specify so with that little word of warning um, i'm going to switch on some of my uh, my web mapping service based geological mapping in this case is going to be the one to fifty thousand scale mapping I'm going to flip on the uh, the bedrock. You can see it's not overly exciting. It just looks like I've turned everything green, but there is some data that's kind of behind here. This tells me that basically I'm I'm operating on chalk. Um, so I'll get rid of that uh, that little clue there. Maybe I'll go for something a little bit more interesting. Perhaps the superficial deposits, and you can see there is a bit of variation there. I have a little look. Basically, these tooltips are coming back from the web mapping service itself. I've got two different types of formation here. In reality, they're, they're both sand and gravel. So I may or may not want to treat them as being similar things from an engineering perspective as I develop um, the project throughout its life. And if I zoom out a little bit further, you can see that obviously there's further variation in the geological map as we work our way through. And you can also hopefully see why it sort of makes sense really just to define yourself that site boundary because I can see where I am in space now, even if I zoom out quite a long way. I'm starting to get a bit of a feel for the ground conditions that I might expect to experience for this particular site. And that could be quite helpful information just to inform uh, what I might be doing when I'm actually planning out my, my site investigation itself. So these are tools that, you know, just by clicking around and, and clicking on a, a few sort of options, I'm starting to get a little bit more familiar with my site. I am going to switch on the, the background mapping and the area of photography once more. Um, so maybe I carry on with that process um, and, you know, I do a site walkover or whatever is appropriate for my particular site. And I get to the point where I am ready to start planning out some whole locations. And if I just switch on a layer here, you will see that in reality, I have cheated and I have already predefined a number of whole locations that you can see are placed underneath there. Each one of those blue points that you can see, they uh, are represented by a line of data in my database. We saw them earlier on briefly on, uh, on my grid there. And you can see that three of those whole locations have got coordinates. If I wanted to, I could pop this grid into edit mode and start typing in coordinates. My preferred option though is to do a right click and maybe set location, jump back to that map and say, yeah, about there and define my whole location in that way. And my map has a little bit of a, an update, a little bit of a refresh. And you'll see the location just appears through when that process has completed. Essentially, then I have an image that I could pass through to my field team and say, that's where I want you to go and put holes in the ground. You can take a view as to whether or not you want to have the uh, the geological mapping or whether you want to have aerial photography or you want road maps or the hybrid view or whatever it is that you want to use. But that's something you could pass through to that field team as an instruction to go and commence their works. Or indeed, you could go through to the location details grid over here. We could do a screenshot of that. Maybe just do a little bit of a refresh first of all, that makes sense. Um, just to call back those coordinate details next to the fourth hole that's just updated with my latitude and longitude there. So I could do a screen dump of that, could export it to CSV, you know, pop it into Excel, wh whatever they're comfortable with, and then send the, uh, the field team off to do some work on, uh, on their particular site. I do recommend actually going through the process of defining your whole locations within open ground first, particularly for projects which perhaps, unlike this one, are quite sizable and maybe involve multiple field teams. Really, because human nature dictates everyone wants to use BH1 as maybe their first hole in the, uh, in the ground. Using this approach, I am telling the field teams what uh, method they are using for defining their locations. I'm doing that bit for them, and they either do it right or they do it wrong. Um, so I'm just taking control and just getting rid of that little headache for, uh, for, for later on. 
So that's a useful thing to, uh, to to bear in mind. Now, that particular project, very early on in the life of our project, uh, very early on in its life, sorry, <clears throat> a couple more projects that I want to uh, I want to show you. Um, one of them is really where I'm going to be focusing a lot of my efforts throughout the rest of the uh, the presentation. So here you can see that there are rather more whole locations. In fact, down over here, you can see that there are ne nearly 50 of them. Um, there's perhaps not as much data across the entire project as uh, as we might like, but there's a fair amount of data for this uh, this first whole location. And you can see I can use that just to produce myself a quick log image on the screen. I've got some SPT results. I've got some samples. I've got this well kind of just represented and a few simple descriptions there as, uh, as well, just brought through into my system. Now, in case you haven't noticed already, again, this particular project, it kind of has a British accent. Just notice how I'm reporting out my SPT results, a little bit different to the way that uh, that most of you will be used to doing it. Do not worry. Um, I'm going to show you something that should give you a little bit of assurance that we can do it in, uh, in kind of stateside as well. So just keep watching and don't don't worry too much about that. I'm going to be coming back to, uh, to this project a little bit later on as well. Though while we are here, I'm going to open up another group of data, this time looking at, uh, at samples just presented within a grid. And there are various tools that I can use to find my way around my data nice and quickly. And you can see here, quick sort of summary, I can see that I've got nearly 80 samples in this borehole 30, very few in the uh, and a couple of other whole locations. But what I want you to remember is that we then have a total of 83 samples in this project at the, uh, at the current time when we come back to that. Okay, so that's one project, gonna be coming back to that in a minute. I do want to give you a little bit of, uh, of assurance. Um, we're gonna come out of that project, jump into this one that I've got at the top here. And this is a project which perhaps is, uh, is a little bit more localized to your particular scenario. First couple of things that you might notice is first of all, We've got the data stored in Imperial, just at the top here. Notice that you have the date format. I've not actually got any dates recorded here, but the date format is perhaps a little bit more what you're used to, rather than what I've got down in the bottom right-hand corner of my uh, of my screen. So, uh, so each of those things a little bit more to, uh, to to your way of working. As we're here, I'm going to show one quick log. In fact, let's show another one as well. And you can see that this is recognizable as a borehole log, similar, but slightly different to what I was showing on the previous project, perhaps a little bit more reflecting the convection, conventions that uh, that you might see. Just notice the, uh, the SPT results, for example. We've got three increments recorded underneath there. We've got some, uh, we've got a weight of hammer just recorded uh, in the start of that particular test there. Um, if we jump across to our other log, notice here we've had uh, an incomplete test or a test that's met with resistance, kind of reported out at that sort of level. Another thing that I can do here as well is my, my logs over on the right hand side there. They're showing the data just as, as columns. Well, there's, there's nothing kind of wrong with that, but equally it can be useful just to flip this around and maybe show um, data in the form of a graph. And while that's drawing, bang, so you can see we've got a graph underneath there as well with M values and the moisture content and our index tests as well. So that's just by coming across and changing this sort of strip set value that I've got at the top here. So the data display is just sort of updates. And that's all because the data is stored within my, my database. I'm just adjusting it to show some, uh, some different results there. Okay, so that's a really, really quick whistle stop tour of, uh, of Open Ground. We're going to be seeing a little bit more of the professional tool, which I am using now. But hypothetically, I, I kind of mentioned earlier on that in that first project we had a look at, I'm like planning out my whole location and giving some instructions through to a, a field team. And for the purposes of our presentation today, we're sort of going to assume 
that um, my field team is represented here on this call by my friend and colleague, Sadur. So Sadur, hopefully you can hear me on the line and you are ready to go and show yeah. us a little bit of Open Ground Collector. So I'm going to pop myself on mute and, uh, and Sadur, you take it away, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Phil. So I will be sharing my screen from my mobile device. And here I have got downloaded the Open Ground Collector. So if you have any kind of Android device, be it mobile or tablet, then you can uh, download uh, Open Ground Collector app. And as Phil said, that after you have set up your Boho locations in Open Ground Professional, then uh, we would recommend that, uh, sorry, just, yeah, so we would recommend uh, to uh, install this open ground collector. And if you have uh, the proper credentials, the login credentials, you will be able to get, get to this window. Now here I am, uh, I am uh, like, uh, you can see four projects uh, that I have downloaded from the cloud. So, uh, but if you, and these are the projects that I have been given access to by the admin of the uh, cloud, uh, of the cloud of Open Ground Professional in my organization. In this case, it is Phil. Now, if I wanted to like, let's say the, the last project that Phil was showing, the US Imperial project, if I wanted to get that, then I would have to press this, uh, press the uh, download from cloud symbol, and then I can download that project. And then I can, then I would have to download the drilling profile uh, of like, which is relevant to the US standards. And then I can uh, start logging in. But here today, I will just focus on on one of the projects. Uh, so um, uh, the Reading Central Railway Station, which is uh, a place situated in England. So if I click on it, then you can see that uh, I have this UK drilling profile already downloaded. So here also the, uh, the drilling profile will not be downloaded. You will have to download it from the cloud before you go to the site. And we always recommend, uh, we always recommend this because uh, uh, you are not aware of the uh, connectivity issues that can happen in the site. So that is why it is better to have all the drill locations already preloaded in your Open Ground Collector app. And then as you go on to the site, you can just start collecting that information. So here I have downloaded the UK drilling profile. And after I have downloaded the UK drilling profile, then there are two options that you can see at the bottom of my screen. One is the download from cloud option, which means the borehole locations that Phil has already defined or the engineer um, who is using Open Ground Professional has already defined in uh, that I can download the, the borehole locations or I, uh, uh, or I can add a borehole location myself. So if I go into the add borehole location, you can see on the screen right now, that I can provide the location ID. So in this case, it can be your borehole one or borehole one uh, a two. The location type. So if I click on the location type, you can see that you can choose the type of borehole that you are mm, doing at the site. So we have all the options. So from cable percussion, rotary coring, dynamic cone penetrometer, we have all these options. Then uh, the location status, so whether it's a draft or a final borehole or not. Then the ground level, the final depth, the start date, and all of this, uh, all of these things. Now after, so I'm not going to uh, define a borehole location right now. So let's say we have uh, we have uh, downloaded from the cloud one of the borehole locations. And if I click on this, so I will first click on edit option. So I'll just like to show you how this looks like. So here I have the borehole location ID where BH0008G. Then the location type is a cable percussive uh, borehole. It's a preliminary borehole and the ground level is 12.7 and the final depth is 20. And it was, uh, it was done on the 24th of October. And you can also see like there is a picture symbol. So that means that you can also take some pictures of, of your borehole at the site. 
and you can store it locally. And then when you have again got the internet, you can again upload it to the cloud for the person sitting in the office and accessing Open Ground Professional. Now, if I click on this, uh, uh, and if I click on this button, which is which gives that of the graph, so you can also create a quick log from uh, from your uh, borehole location. Sorry, I'm just mm -hmm. one second. Just yeah. so you get the link of that. Yeah. So here, yeah, I'm back, and then I open up the. So here I am in the shift zone. So here, if I go into the edits, I can show you. So when did uh, when did it start, and what kind of equipment are we using? What is the crew, and how was the weather, and any general remarks? And then the the major thing that is uh, that is quite important with regards to the borehole is the information, and you can uh, you can. Um, you can summarize a whole lot of information for your borehole location. So starting from hole and drilling information, you can see all of this. Then you can go for field tests, uh, like all of this, and uh, it will depend on the drilling profile as well. So let's say if I go into the sample information, I can go into sample information. I can type in the depth top where it was collected, the depth base, then the sample reference, then the type that whether it was a bulk disturb sample or a core sample or a small disturb sample so there are all these options that you can choose from and then the recovery length and the remarks and finally let's say if i go into detailed description as well so if i go into the description uh, option in one second i'm trying to find out the driller's description uh, yes, driller's description. If I go into the driller's description and if I press on the description itself, so you can see there is an autofill menu where uh, you can have this predictive option. So you can start with your silty clay, silt or gravel. Then you have the option to choose from the consistency, the bedding, the color, the secondary constituents. So all of this can be done with uh, with open ground. Uh, open ground collector app and then after you have done all of this uh, you can just go back and then if you go back once again so you can see the this option this uh, sync option which is green ticked right now uh, once you get internet and you click on the sync option all the data that you have uh, you have collected in this app will be uploaded to the cloud and then uh, Phil, in this case, will be getting access to all of them in Open Ground Professional. So yeah, that's about it that I wanted to cover for Open Ground Collector. Uh, Phil, is there anything that you wanted me to cover additionally? I think that's good. Thank you very okay. much, Sadil. Thank you. Okay, if you just want to uh, stop sharing your screen then, Sadil. Yes, yes, I forgot the important bit. <laughs> You've got to prove that it's all live, you see. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Right. Okay. So let me click some uh, click some buttons, and hopefully, Sadur, you can help me out. Just confirm that you can see open ground again. Yes, I can confirm. I can see. Marvelous. So you can see that I've been a bit busy while uh, Sadur was showing you a little bit with Open Ground Collector. Um, so something I I kind of omitted to uh, to mention when we're having a look at that uh, that US project. Um, the way in which you kind of build descriptions is maybe a little bit different to, to what we do in the uh, in the UK. So I thought I'd show you show you this just again to uh, to give you something that's a little bit more what you're uh, what you're used to. So what happens here is that we have these full descriptions that are built together. Notice that you have USCS codes or indeed whatever um, convention you're actually using for your particular project for categorizing data and producing hash patterns and so forth. And the way in which your individual descriptions are built, either based on soil or based on rock, we're looking at individual components and defining specific terms underneath each of those headers, because that's what you're used to doing, of course. Um, similar with the, with the soil, but the criteria are slightly different. 
Now, what then happens is they are then built together into kind of like a composite description that you kind of see in each of those screens, one, one for the rock and one for the soil is appropriate, and they're all written back and kind of collated together in this main view that's obviously then what you actually have displayed on logs or you do whatever is appropriate uh, appropriate for them. So I just wanted to show you that really, really quickly as I kind of forgot that earlier on. And I thought it was just uh, just few things. Something to do a mention there just reminded me to go and uh, go and bring that back there. Okay, jolly good. So let me go into this uh, this other project then. We kind of mentioned earlier on. I'm keeping an eye on the uh, on the time, and I'm I'm kind of a little bit a little bit yeah. I think we're kind of a little bit up up against it. So I'm gonna trim out a little bit of content um but what i just want to very very quickly just make you aware of more than anything is um because i've got a great big database at the back of my projects and we're punching all this data through i can do a lot more stuff than just produced logs or, or even just logs and maps um all my sample information is uh, is here, so I can use this as the basis for building up maybe a lab schedule that's contained within my particular project. So I'd hope to do a little bit more with this and, and show you a little bit more detail on this. It's quite nice in that if I kind of schedule a test that actually has a condition specified against it, and I try and uh, sort of make changes underneath there, it doesn't let me do so unless I've actually given a response to each of those conditions. Notice that you get this red exclamation mark hover over the top, gives me a clue, and it kind of says, look, I, you've got to reply to this query about this Atterberg test that you've just scheduled. I'll pop that in underneath here, and you can see it's just asking me, do you want a four or a one point test? I'm greedy, so I'm going to go for four. Bang. And I can then save that change underneath there and sort of move on with my life. Okay. So that's, you know, just a little bit of a highlight. That's a little bit of a hint of the stuff that I'm, I'm not showing you. Of course, what a lot of people People do is they actually want to take that same data that they've got in the cloud and maybe report it out elsewhere maybe you know punch it out to excel or whatever else might be appropriate so that is uh, is an option that i want to have a little bit of a look at although um, I don't have an example that's looking specifically at lab test results, but hopefully you can use your imagination to uh, to kind of fill in the blanks a little bit if i jump back over here this is the Open Ground Cloud launcher. So off screen, before we started the session, I had hit this button here to launch professional. And that is the application you can see in the uh, in the background. I'm going to fire up the, uh, the Excel extension because it's a cloud-based product. You can see that it just fires out updates as they're available. In this particular case, though, I don't want to keep you waiting. So I'm just going to launch the application underneath the uh, the previous version. It's not a compulsory update at this particular stage. So this is just gonna fire up good old Excel, but it's gonna be Excel with a bonus ribbon kind of contained within it. So in many ways, quite a simple little tool that we're going to be, uh, going to be using here. If I go through to that ribbon, I'm gonna click on my projects button over here. And hopefully, if I just expand these out, you might be able to see one, two, maybe three projects that are a little bit familiar, because those are the three that we opened up earlier on in this particular session. So I'm going to grab this, this project here. I'm going to, uh, to open that one up. And we'll, uh, we'll bring that together underneath there. OK, and over here, you can see that I have an option to display a, uh, an A-line plot, especially an Atterberg chart. So, and we have various other options as well, but we'll jump into that one just because I happen to know that I have some data already stored on my particular project. So here we have a chart here. It could be whatever chart. You, you, you want to be showing, you know, we can design our own templates using this particular tool. If I hit the generate button here, essentially what that does is it forces the template to have a chat with the data, go and get the data and bring it through into Excel. And now I have an output that I could save as just an ordinary Excel spreadsheet and pass it through to someone who has never, ever even heard of open ground. So we have our results over here. Not, not many of them, but we have, have some. Uh, if we have a look at the clay result, you can see that that's plotted underneath there, whereas the silt, yes, that's kind of plotted in a sensible place as well. 
but it gives a little illustration for what you can do with the uh, with the Excel template. All I'm doing is just tapping into that data that's available on the cloud and reporting it out into this sort of spreadsheet format. Um, similarly, we have uh, have tools that are available for Power BI as well, which is perhaps a little bit more the uh, the modern answer to uh, to such things. So if you're a bit of a Power BI whiz, great, you know you can uh, you can exploit that with uh, with Open Ground as uh, as well. Okay, so um, let's see, We're a bit narrow on time, but um, one quick thing that I want to show you this particular project, I have some data within here already. I didn't do the lab schedule, so the bit that I didn't get back was data from the lab. But I just want to show you something really, really quickly. If the lab were able to supply me with their results, not just as a PDF or a spreadsheet or whatever else, but in a CSV format, I can then add in some of the data through to my project. So I'm just going to do a small subset of this to uh, try and respect time a little bit and not uh, not upset our generous hosts too much. So there we go. So we'll uh, hit this button here. So this takes us through what we call a wizard. There are a few little steps that we uh, that we jump through here. What is actually happening in this particular stage is Open Ground is having a look in the file and it's having a review to see what data it can find. Although it says importing there, that just means it's bringing into memory rather than bringing it into the project database. It has found the data for one whole location. If I had more, they would list underneath here. I could clear the selection, select everything, be selective over which ones I want, and kind of move on from there. I'm happy with that selection. Let's hit the next button. We move to the next step. It says, what types of data can you find? I've just found moisture content. It could have a whole bunch of other stuff listed underneath here. Again, I can clear my selection, select individuals, just as we've seen previously. So I'm going to hit the next button there. Now, at this particular stage, Open Ground is keeping that data it's found in the file in memory, but it's also having a little look to see what data it can find in the project database. And what happens then, it's sort of comparing these two at quite a high level. And just give me an idea as to what I might expect to change if I continue with this import process. Now, if this was a real live project, I would not have any moisture content results from my lab already in this project, in which case that 79 would actually appear underneath this column here. There would be additions, there would be new lines of data. As it is, I'm just basically replacing data I've already got, so they appear over here. But just from the distribution of numbers, you get an idea as to what is going to change as a result of this screen. In my humble opinion, this is the most important screen that you will find in that import wizard. So give it your attention and get used to just reading it, just scanning over it quickly. I am going to break my own rules because I am, again, conscious of time. But uh, we've got this option here take database snapshot. That is great. That is your get out of jail free card. If ever you import the wrong data into the wrong project, you use that option just to go back in time and pretend it never happened. Um, but I'm uh, do as I say, not as I do. I'm going to hit the next button just so uh, we spare a little bit of time and, uh, and bring that data through instead. So the snapshot is something that is very, very helpful. Um, and quite often you'll find that you'll you'll need it. You'll be in a bit of a panic um, <laughs> if you're not kind of got it there. Anyway, the import process has actually completed. So let's hit the finish button underneath here. You'll see the project refreshes, it updates, and then we can go and find our data. We could look underneath our Project Explorer here at the soil and rocks lab data, but equally we could do a little search and just type in moisture that takes us through to the right place hopefully you can see we've got 79 results as we saw previously we open up that data underneath there we're in a grid we're in a database grid so we can do filtering we can do sorting um, in fact let's do a little bit of filtering for moisture content results that are greater than or equal to 40 bang and we will put that together underneath there focusing on whatever parameters what Whatever ranges, values are important for those parameters to, to kind of find out a little bit more information. Really, really quickly, I'm going to save this as a moisture content location group. <clears throat> that is basically just saving the uh, the whole IDs that we've got here. Got a thing called a save search, which is really useful as well. But again, we're get a bit pushed on time. So if I now go to a zoom on map. 
In fact, I'm going to do a little bit of a refresh here as well. And carry that long. Yeah, let's go and just build it again. I think it's taking a little bit long. <clears throat> And there we go. So there's our borehole 30. And if I just switch on my location group here, you should hopefully see that this then appears once it's fully loaded up with a little marker. Now that makes that individual hole location just that little bit easier to identify as distinct from any of the others. That symbol could be a different symbol, could be a different color. I might actually, if I was using a save search, have it um, reporting out data, maybe the number of moisture contents that are greater than 40, you know, or whatever parameter it is that you have applied underneath there. So quite useful little tools just to bring everything back together through into the map once again. Okay, so Sadur, I was wondering, have you, have you could just give us a quick demonstration of what LeapFrog is about and how that relates to open ground? Maybe just two, three minutes, if that's possible. Yeah, sure. So I will share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah, we got that. Yeah, great. So yeah, we are here on the user interface of LeapFrog Works. Uh, just to uh, give you a very brief idea. Uh, LeapFrog Works is our implicit uh, 3D geological modeling tool, and this is what you are. Uh, this is this is what you see when you start working on a project for the first time. And uh, basically, uh, the project tree on the left is where uh, the heart of the modeling engine of LeapFrog Works lies. So you import your data, validate your data, you create your models, and then you generate your outputs. And this is the big white rectangle that you see where, which we call as the scene. And this is where you do most of your 3D visualization. So anything that you bring into LeapFrog, anything that you create in LeapFrog, everything can be visualized in the three dimensions in this one. So let me just give you an, a very simple idea about what, uh, what you can create in, in uh, LeapFrog. But before that, let me give you an idea about so let's say after you have uh, after you have set up your borehole database in open ground then you can directly uh, link to open ground uh, by going into the borehole data in the project tree right clicking there and you can see that there are three options and the third option is this one which is import boreholes by open ground and when i click on that I will be directly one second i, will, I just have to give my bentley credentials and then I can go back to uh, LeapFrog once again. And here you can see that I have been given three instances of the cloud. So these are the instances that have uh, that I have been provided uh, access to. And uh, I will be going for the training, uh, uh, training cloud instance. And here you can see that this was the project uh, kind of being worked by Phil uh, at the at this point. And then if I go into next, then it will be analyzing all the uh, open ground data. And for the important to be from, we just need uh, like for starters, we need two of the uh, tables. One is the color table, which gives the location details. And then the other one we will need as the field geological description. So I will press import and you can see that LeapFrog has already read the uh, relevant columns. I will just go through that quickly. And then after it has done that, so if I bring that in, in those boreholes, one second, I will just bring in the interval tables so that it's, and uh, yeah, so here I can, sorry, it's just my clock, which is, uh, I can change the scale. By, yeah, and then I have brought in the port walls into the project. So this is this this is how easy it is to in order to bring in the port holes. But uh, the main like uh, you will be using Leapfrog Works for uh, uh, creating a three D geological model, and this is just an example. So this was this is a greenfield geological model that we built for a linear infrastructure project. Uh, uh, 
and you can see that we have uh, and this geological model has been built entirely in the frogworks using the internal algorithm of the frogworks uh, and using the borehole import data and because now the these this borehole data has been imported from open ground i can also reload the boreholes and i can also connect to uh, open ground uh, even even after that so if i go into reload boreholes you will see that it again connects to the same project in open ground and it tries to uh, reload the boreholes so once the connection is established with open ground it's uh, it, it it is there for that borehole database so this is just an example that you can build in the frog and then if i had to show you a quick visualization so i can cut the project anywhere and i can see how the model uh, kind of changes evolves along uh, along the side and i can cut it anywhere and i can make a thick slice like this i can uh, view only the red volume so i can make everything invisible and then i can just go into the red volume and i can see like this so yeah this is like this is just the very beginning of of leapfrog i mean if you're interested we uh, we can we can uh, we can give you a larger demonstration of the of the project uh, of the of the product okay thank you Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Sidur. So uh, we're just going to jump really, really quick back to the PowerPoint. You've had a taster of this particular workflow or the first two, maybe three steps within it. There is uh, is more in the full, uh, full workflow. Um, equally, I have a slide here to ask if there are any questions. I think it's probably more accurate to, to kind of ask our very generous host if there is any time for any questions, because obviously I don't want to distract from any, anything else that's uh, kind of going on. We did have one question come through the chat um, from attendee Mohammed K. Ferris. He's okay. asking, um, how can we get it? Uh, does it have a demo version? And I think he's specifically talking about open ground. Okay. Okay. Cool. So the the first port of call, if open ground is the kind of thing that uh, that interests you, is uh, to speak to a member of our, our sales team. Um, that's that's sort of no obligation. It's just an initial conversation. They can help sort of work out the mechanisms and uh, and stuff. Quite often, you'll find that if uh, if you are already um, in an organisation that is using Bentley software, that can be quite quite helpful. Um, as a part of that, and hence it kind of needs uh, needs an appropriate way of uh, of setting things up. But typically, what they can do is do like a high level tour and uh, and unpack some of your requirements and stuff, as much as talking about dollar signs and so forth. Does that help? Yeah, I think that's a great answer. And I went ahead and shared the link to a sequence page specifically for Open Ground if it helps you, you know, get to being able to ask that question quicker. Brilliant. I just wanted to raise one point. So the I have the links to the connected workflow ready. We, where where should I put that uh, in in the in the meeting group chat? Will that be a proper place to put the? Yeah, if you'll put them there, I'll move okay. them into the YouTube chat so that all the okay. attendees can access them. Yeah. So I have put the so as Phil mentioned that they, they were three days. And uh, I've also mentioned the products. So the slide where Phil mentions the products, I, I've also uh, segregated the days as per the products. So, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So if you like what you saw here, that's that's your homework to, to have a look at those. But obviously, after the conference has been completed, because you're going to be busy with that. Excellent, okay. Right. Well, thank you to uh, our generous hosts and thank you for, to, to you for, for joining us. And I do hope that you enjoy the rest of your conference. So uh, do take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.